Hello, this is Pastor Frank from the Balsam Bible Chapel. And uh, if you want to follow along in your Bible in this message, I'm going to be looking at Daniel chapter 8 and Matthew chapter 20. Daniel chapter 8 and Matthew chapter 20. And if you're turning there, while you're turning there, I, I read about a news reporter that was out in a boat and the news reporter fell overboard and they decided to make him an anchor. News anchor, anchor. That's one of the hard things about telling a joke to a camera. You don't know if people are laughing, if they are rolling their eyes, or if they, uh, at least at church in the congregation, I can tell that people are moaning and groaning or rolling their eyes or smiling. But anyhow, it became an anchor. In life, we need an anchor. But there are certain times in life where we're, we're more conscious of our need of an anchor. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 18 and 19, talk about us having a strong consolation or a strong comfort, encouragement, refreshment. Uh, having a strong consolation, those who have fled for refuge to lay hope, hold of the hope that's set before us. And it says this hope we have as an anchor of the soul both sure and steadfast. So this anchor of hope is sure and steadfast, and it gives us, as the New King James says, strong consolation, or it gives us good comfort and, and encouragement and refreshment. The purpose and the value of an anchor is to keep us from drifting or being blown where we don't want to go, where it's not good to be. The stronger the wind or the stronger the current, the bigger and better of an anchor we must have. In Acts chapter 27, there's the story of the Apostle Paul on his way to Rome and about the storm that came up and the shipwreck. And in Acts chapter 27, beginning at verse 27, the New Living Translation puts it this way, quote, About midnight on the 14th night of the storm, as we were being driven across the Sea of Adria, or the Adriatic Sea, the sailors sensed land was near. They dropped a weighted line and found that the water was 120 feet deep. But a little later, they measured again and found it was only 90 feet deep. At this rate, they were afraid that they would soon be driven against the rocks along the shore, so they threw out four anchors. Four. They threw out four anchors from the back of the ship and prayed for daylight. They desperately wanted to stop that ship so that it wouldn't be driven into the rocks, and so they put out four anchors. That's how intense the storm was, apparently, to make sure that that ship came to a stop. These are turbulent days in which we live. The winds of adversity are blowing, and there's a danger of running aground against the rocks, both spiritually and emotionally, we need an anchor. Again, Hebrews 6, 19, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. The book of Daniel is an anchor for us in these days in which we live. It's a good anchor. It gives us hope. I repeat, the book of Daniel gives us hope. In Romans chapter 15, verse 4, the Bible says, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, and that includes the book of Daniel, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Again, Daniel is an anchor for us in these days in which we live. The book of Daniel points us to the sovereign God Most High. Uh, I'm in the second half of the book of Daniel, the uh, section that deals with the visions that Daniel has, um, and so I'm in chapter 8. An in-depth look at the visions of chapters 7 through 12 is better suited to a Bible study format uh, than it is to a Sunday message. At least it is for me. But since I am going through this series in Daniel on Sunday mornings, I need to touch on these. So, Daniel chapter 8. After the initial, initial vision in Daniel 8, Daniel writes this beginning at verse 15. He says, Then it happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning that suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. 
Let me just stop here and say that I would encourage you to read through the these chapters uh, on your own and meditate upon them. I'm just skimming uh, a little bit here. So there's this individual that appears, uh, and he has the appearance of a man. Verse 16, And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, who called and said, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. Verse 18. Now as he was speaking with me, I was in a deep sleep with my face to the ground, but he touched me and stood me upright. And he said, Look, I am making known to you what shall happen in the latter time of the indignation, for at the appointed time the end shall be. At the appointed time, the end shall be. Skip down to verse 26. Verse 26. And the vision of the evenings and mornings which was told is true. Therefore seal up the vision, for it refers to many days in the future. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days afterward. I rose and went about the king's business. I was astonished at, by the vision, but no one understood it. Now Daniel 7 and 8 are the only two visions received prior to Babylon's fall. According to chapter 7, verse 1, and chapter 8, verse 1, there's a couple of years that separates these two chapters, these two visions. But these two chapters are history for us, but they were future for Daniel. When Daniel had this vision in chapter 8, and also the one in chapter 7, it was still future for him. The Medes and the Persians of chapter 8, verse 20, will show up in chapter 6 of Daniel. And here we are in somewhere chapter 5 of Daniel. And so for Daniel it was future, but for us it's something of the past. Greece in chapter 8, verse 21 would come after the Medes and Persians. So this is all future for Daniel. In Daniel 7, he is dealing with four kingdoms, three out from where he was. He, in, in this chapter, is in the Babylon, Babylonian Empire. Babylon hasn't fallen yet. That happens at the end of chapter uh, 5. And so from where Daniel was at this point, there's the Medes and the Persians, there's Greece, there is Rome, and then there is the kingdom of the Most High. In Daniel chapter 8, he's being told about Greece. The Medes and the Persians haven't even come yet. And so again, this is all future for Daniel. But this goes back to the dream of the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had in Daniel chapter 2. And it would be good to go back and reread Daniel chapter 2. In commenting on Nebuchadnezzar's dream in Daniel chapter 2, Warren Wearsby, the beloved brother in the Lord, Warren Wearsby says this, quote, The large image in Daniel 2, verses 36 through 45, represents four Gentile kingdoms. The head of gold is Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian kingdom, verses 37 and 38. It lasted from 636 B.C. to 539 B.C. Jeremiah called Babylon, quote, a golden cup in the Lord's hand, end quote. That's Jeremiah 51, verse 7. Wearsby goes on. The chest and the arms of silver is the Medo-Persian kingdom, 539 to 330 B.C. Darius the Mede conquered Babylon, and that's found in Daniel chapter 5, verses 30 and 31. The belly of this statue of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the belly and thighs of bronze represent the Grecian kingdom, 330 to 63 BC. Alexander the Great established what was probably the largest empire in ancient times. He died in 323 BC. The legs of iron and feet of iron and clay represent the Roman Empire from 63 BC to AD 475. He says iron represents strength, but clay represents weakness. Rome was strong in law, organization, and military might, 
But the empire included so many different peoples that this created weakness. Chapter 2, verse 43 of Daniel. The destruction of the image is coming is the coming of Jesus Christ, the stone, to judge the, his enemies and to establish his universal kingdom. End quote. And so Daniel 7 and 8 are a fuller picture of what Nebuchadnezzar's dream pointed to. So, okay, now, turn in your Bible to Matthew 20. Matthew 20. It's going to seem like I'm talking about a whole different subject, but I will attempt to tie it together with Daniel 7 and 8 in the end. Matthew chapter 20, beginning in verse 1. Here we have one of Jesus' many parables. The Bible says, and this is Jesus speaking, For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with his laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went about out about the third hour and saw others standing in idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Again he went out about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle, and said to them, Why have you been standing here idle all day? And they said to him, Because no one hired us. And he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and whatever is right you will receive. Verse 8. So when evening had come, the landowner, or excuse me, the owner of the vineyard said to the steward, Call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with the last to the first. And when those came who were hired about the eleventh hour, they each received a denarius, or a day's wage. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more. And they likewise received each a denarius. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, These last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us, who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he, the landowner, answered one of them and said, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to this last man the same as to you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? So the last will be first and the first last, for many are called but few chosen. Again, verse 15, the landowner says, Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? In verse 11, the people complain against the landowner because they find fault with what the landowner is doing with his decision. Complaining. <laughs> ah, complaining is so natural to our fleshly nature. Complain, complain, complain. It is so easy to find fault somewhere with this and that and that person, this person. It's so easy to find fault. And it seems like sometimes when there isn't a whole lot of fault to, to be found, we can, we can find some. We can find some. Satan is referred to as the accuser of the brethren. That's Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. The accuser of the brethren. And the Bible says in 1 John 5, 19, that the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So therefore, things like finding fault and complaining and accusing, it comes so natural. In verse 15, the landowner says, Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? The answer is, of course. Of course the owner can do with what he wishes with, with his own things. They, they belong to him. They're his. He can do whatever he wants with them. We belong to God. Brothers and sisters, we belong to God. He created us. Psalm 139 says, beginning at verse 13, for you were formed, or excuse me, for you formed, it's a prayer of the psalmist, for you, talking to the Lord, you formed my inward part. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. 
My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written. The day is fashioned for me when as yet there was none of them. God has created us. In our mother's womb, he created us. And his breath gives us life. In Acts 17, verse 25, it says, He gives to all life, breath, and all things. He gives us our breath, our life, and all things. All things that we have are really His, given to us. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, the Bible says that the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. In Isaiah 42, verse 5, it says, Thus says the Lord, or excuse me, thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it, and spirit to those who walk on it. He gives us our breath. He first created us, and then he sustains us. In Daniel chapter 5, Daniel says to King Belshazzar, the one who is king when Daniel had his visions of chapter 7 and 8. He says to him in Daniel chapter 5 verse 23, And you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your lord, your wives, and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. And, now get this, the last part of, of verse 23 of Daniel 5. And the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all of your ways, you have not glorified. Because God created us and keeps us alive, we belong to him. And he can do with us whatever he wishes. It's not for us to complain. It's not for us to find fault with what God is doing or allowing to happen to us. We belong to him. To it's not right for us to even question him. Nebuchadnezzar made a tremendous statement in Daniel chapter 4, verses 34 and 35. He says this, he says, At the end of the time I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever and ever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. He does according to his will amongst the inhabitants of the earth, including in your life and in my life. And Nebuchadnezzar says, no one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? And so it is not for us to complain. It is not for us to find fault with what God is doing or allowing to happen. And it is not uh, for us to even question him. Psalm 24 verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness, and its fullness, the world and those that dwell therein. Let me repeat. Psalm 24 1. The earth is the Lord's. It's not yours. It's not mine. It's the Lord's. And all... Its fullness, the world, and those, that's you and me and everybody else, those who dwell therein. The Apostle Paul quoted this twice in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The earth is the Lord's. That includes all the nations of the earth as seen in the book of Daniel. And today, that includes the United States of America, it includes Canada, it includes Russia, the Ukraine, the nations. So the earth is the Lord, Lord's and those who dwell therein. Again, that includes you and me. That includes our children and grandchildren, our families. They belong to the Lord. 
That includes our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers, our classmates. We belong to the Lord. The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. The very idea that the earth is the Lord's means he is the owner, Matthew chapter 20. And he can do whatever he wishes with that which is his own, which belongs to him. We may not understand it. Just as some of the workers in Matthew chapter 20 didn't understand what the landowner was doing, why give equal to those who worked one hour or those who worked all day long? Why? They didn't understand. We don't always understand, and we don't have to understand. It may not be that we would, it's what we would do, given our view and understanding of how things should work and our work. It's not maybe what we would do. But that doesn't matter. Things don't belong to us. They belong to the Lord and he can do whatever he wishes. We can complain about what God is doing. And a lot of the workers in Matthew 20 did that very thing. They complained. Or we can acknowledge that God is sovereign and that God is good. God is sovereign and God is good. The sovereign God is good. In Matthew 20, verse 15, the owner said, Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? We complain about things happening and how they're happening, why they're happening. We complain about them when we forget that a good God is ultimately in control. The world stage and the nations, the visions of Daniel points this out. They're under the control of a sovereign God who is good. We may not be understanding of uh, understanding what's going on. Why, why is this happening? But we need to trust that the sovereign God is in control and that he is good. And the things confronting me and you personally are the things that are happening in our life, the things that are really throwing us off, the things that we don't understand, the things that we would find it very easy to complain about, they too are under the control of a good and sovereign God. That's why Romans 8.28 says, We know that all things work together for good. All things work together for good for those who love God and to those who are the called according to his purpose. How is it that all things, how is it that this particular thing that's happening right now in my life or in the world, how how is it that, how can it be good? Because God is sovereign and God is good. Heavenly Father, Thank you for who you are. You are sovereign. The book of Daniel so beautifully shows your sovereignty. Your control over nations that aren't going to show up for hundreds of years. You are sovereign. You are in control. The things which were future to Daniel, you saw them. You saw the, every detail of them. Father, uh, we ourselves belong to you. The same sovereign God of Daniel is the sovereign God of, of me and of my brothers and sisters who are watching this. Father, the things of our lives we don't understand. So often we don't understand. We don't understand many times what you're up to, why you're allowing certain things. Just like those individuals in the field, the workers didn't understand the landowner, why he was doing certain things the way he was and Lord, help us not to complain. We don't understand. So often we don't understand. But help us to have faith in the sovereign God who works all things together for good to those that love you. I pray for my brother or sister that might be undergoing a, a big thing right now in their life. Uh, they have a lot of questions. They have a lot of uncertainties. 
Father, I pray that your spirit would speak to them and minister to them and remind them that you are not only in control, but that you are good. And they may not see it now, they may not understand it now, but you who are good will work even this thing out for good because they love you, because they're one of your called. So bless us, Lord, and keep us for your glory and for your honor. And again, thank you that we are in uh, the hand of a sovereign, loving, and good God. Lord, you have told us in the book of John that we're in your hands and no one can pluck us from your hands. And so when we don't understand and when things seem unsettling, help us to rest in your hand. Jesus said that for us to come to him, all who are weary and heavy laden, and we would find rest. That's what we need these days, Lord. So thank you for the anchor of your word, the anchor of hope that your word gives. You are good. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless you, brothers and sisters.